So let me let me welcome you all to uh, and, and thank you, thank you, thank you for agreeing to participate in, and I think uh, a very important discussion. Um, my name is Joe Gibbons. I uh, I am a uh, I'm going to be your moderator today. I I uh, have been organizing in New Orleans for going on you know, well. Let me just say since 1972. Uh, prior to that in the military since 1969. So it's been quite a while. But I teach uh, civic engagement and um, and community organizing at Loyola University and had the, the pleasure of working with um, some of your uh, advisors and, um, and professors, uh, Dr. Ashraf Ishmael over at, at Dillard University. Uh, let me thank you for, um, for agreeing to to host as the, uh, the Center for Racial Justice at Dillard University to host this important conversation between the leaders of today. And, um, and so uh, Dr. Ashraf Ishmaela, and thank you to the Center for Racial Justice. Dr. Clyde Robinson joins us from Southern University. Clyde is the, uh, Dr. Robinson is the uh, professor and director of the Center for Af African American Studies at Southern University. Dr. Alvaro uh, Alcazar, uh, one of my mentors and a uh, retired director of the Toomey Center, the Toomey Center for Justice at uh, adjunct professor in education and religious studies at Loyola. Uh, and Dr. Brian Turner has not joined us, I don't believe, but uh, uh, is one of our team. He's a clinical psychologist and associate professor of psychology uh, Director of African American uh, Diaspora Studies at Xavier University, and this group of of, um, of, of important uh, and I, I think uh, uh, cultural holders in our in our universities have, have asked you to represent your university and in a very important discussion. I want them to introduce their students. To uh, to the panel, and after that, uh, we will uh, begin our round of questions. That you, I think, you've been prepared to answer these questions or to respond. Uh, so, with that being said, uh, uh, Dr. Robinson, would you start with uh, your student leader from Southern University? Well, I'm uh, immensely proud to introduce <clears throat> Brother Jamal Williams, Brother Jamal is a native New Orleanian. And brother Joe, you will take a particular interest in this next fact. He is a resident of our beloved neighborhood, the Ponderosa, Pontchartrain Park. Uh, he's a product of the New Orleans public school system. Brother Jamal is uh, an atypical student in that uh, he came to the university a little later, uh, a little later in his life. Um, at one point, he was known in some of the Younger folk in the um, in the audience might recognize him. He was uh, Ninth Ward Gucci, a very successful rapper uh, and um, a music producer uh, from the city of New Orleans some years ago. At one point, Brother Jamal decided that uh, uh, what he was doing was not enough, and so he procured employment first at Suno. And then he recognized that uh, he could compete academically and became a student and an employee at Suno. And then later on, he discovered through his activism that he could lead the student population. He could influence them. And so he became involved with the SGA. Uh, last year, he was the vice president of the Student Government Association. This year, he's the president of the Student Government Association. He is a graduating senior majoring in public administration. He has already been, uh, uh, at least he's already applied to several uh, master's programs, and I'm sure he will be accepted uh, uh, pretty shortly. Uh, again, the quintessential student leader, Brother Jamal. Listen, uh, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Robinson, um, at any time I need to be uh, introduced in any form or fashion, I'm going to call you. 
Call on. Well, hey, Brother Joe, you know that, brother. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, uh, Brother Jamal, I don't know if you're going to be able to add anything. Uh, yeah, like, I, yeah, I was just about to say that. I, I don't know right, what else to right. say. Dr. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Israel, will you introduce your uh, Dillard University leaders, please? <laughs> Yeah, I'm very honored to uh, introduce our two student leaders from uh, Dillard University, um, you know, both Toya Smith and Kaylin Tanner. Uh, both are, uh, I can't take credit for either of them. They're both urban studies and public policy majors. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful I'm able to steal them every now and then uh, for these um, for these events. Uh, I've had both in my classes, um, very first semester that they arrived at Dillard. And I must admit, I had a different impression of them the initial time I, you, I met them, and and and, uh, and I've watched them grow and blossom as they're you know getting ready to uh, graduate. I'm very proud of them as they get ready to uh, graduate um, uh, this semester. Uh, and I'll read you um, you know the bios. You know, Toya Smith is a social entrepreneur who works with power building organizations to create educational, civic, and policy solutions for Black and Brown youth. Her interest in public policy began to blossom in the spring of 2018 when she had the opportunity to work with the Louisiana House of Representatives and more intimately, the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus. It was there she gained intimate understanding about the social economic inequalities facing the people of Louisiana, legislative process, and the systems actively working to dis disenfranchise marginalized communities. Toya guides her work by the activism and truth of life, uh, Paul e. Murray, Toy is an experienced organizer, a very passionate student, an educator, and adept grant writer. Toya, as I mentioned, is a current uh, senior at Dillard University where she's studying urban studies and public policies. She's looking to graduate and, and hopefully uh, send her off to um, law school. Again, we're very proud to have Toya on this panel and, uh, and again, appreciate the outstanding work she has done for Dillard during her four times, uh, or four years, I'm sorry, uh, that she has spent with us. Kaylin Tanner, um, also very proud to have, her, have had her, the student, as she looks to also graduate um, this semester in urban studies and um, public policy. Uh, she's a reproductive justice advocate who strives to uplift the voices and experiences of young Black women in marginalized communities. She's also a graduating senior, as I mentioned, studying urban studies and also minoring in criminal justice from Los Angeles. Uh, Kaylin currently serves as 85th Miss Dillard University. Uh, which we're very proud of her for that. Um, a sexual assault task uh, force co-chair and a AACP LDF HPCU ambassador and special programming intern for the Center of Student Engagement and Leadership at Dillard University. Her passion is reproductive justice, civic engagement, policy reform, sparked by her position as in her own voice, a National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda inaugural cohort fellow, in post-graduation, and I'm, again, very proud of, of Kaylin. She will be attending the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. Uh, so that'll be an exciting endeavor as we see Kaylin go on to do some great things to achieve her master's of public health and health policy. Her long-term goals are to aspire to represent California as a Congresswoman. So we're very thankful and grateful to have both Toya and Kaylin on this panel discussion um, representing Dillard University this, this afternoon. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Alv Alvaro Alcazar, can you introduce uh, Hannah and uh, uh, and Ethan, and I will introduce uh, Sydney and um, and Layla. Okay, um, Ethan and Hannah were students in my classes, and. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what I try to do, and then I'll connect them uh, based on what we try to do in our classes. I am both uh, a Buddhist and, and a Christian. And uh, <clears throat> in my classes, I introduced the idea that uh, we need to rebuild our world and our planet and our humanity. And there are three basic things that we need to do. Uh, there are three things that are destroying our humanity and our world, and that is greed, hatred and lies, okay? And uh, to transform the killing forces of hatred, greed, and lies in our planet, we need to replace them with generosity, compassion, and truth. And generosity and compassion and truth <clears throat> could be a characteristic of a person, but it could also be a characteristic of a system. Uh, persons can be quick killers, 
and systems are slow killers. So we need to pay attention to quick killers and slow killers. And Ethan and Hannah, in both of my classes, I can say to you that they are both experts in how we transform greed, hatred, and lies. They really started at my students, but they have also become my teachers. And my success as a teacher happens when my students become my teachers. And so Ethan and Hannah have become my teachers. And that is my introduction for both of them. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alcazar. Thank you, Dr. Al. And uh, finally, um, we uh, have joining us uh, on, on this panel, uh, Layla Jones and um, Sydney Rockwell. Um, I am, you know, I opened up a can of worms when I said we were going to introduce, and I'm pulling up now, uh, the, um, the uh, Layla is a freshman at Loyola. She's in my class, both Sydney and, and Layla are both in our community organizing in our honors uh, civic engagement class over at Loyola University. And Layla is a freshman at Loyola. She grew up in, in Denver, uh, Denver, Colorado, was president of her high school's Black Student Alliance. Uh, growing up, uh, uh, up as a biracial woman, she has an interest in racial justice and intersection, uh, intersectional direct action. Um, I, the, when I selected Sydney and Layla, it was because of how I saw their passion around the issue of, of, uh, of social justice and racial justice. And this issue was beginning to surface as a concern at, at uh, Loyola University. Uh, likewise, Sydney, uh, who is a sophomore at, at Loyola University where she's a double major in finance and economics. Recently, she graduated from uh, the Fund for uh, American Studies, Public Policy and International Affairs Capital Semester Program where she was awarded a full scholarship to attend and received outstanding student award. She serves as a senator in Loyola University's government and is the vice president of the Loyola Sailing, uh, uh, Sailing Club, the Economics Club. Additionally, Sydney is the oldest of four girls and an avid golf player, and she actively volunteers with organizations. Listen, you know, listening at, at, at your bios and listening to this introduction that you're getting from your your professors and your faculty advisors uh, really says to me that that you a special, really special group of, of, of young leaders. And when I look at you today, um, I see nine students and it was perhaps intentional for us to select nine student leaders. Because it was 60 years ago when nine, nine students uh, were on, on a Greyhound bus members of the Freedom Riders were attacked and bombed in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, there were uh, seven blacks, um, let's see, five blacks and four whites on that bus. At that moment, they were right in the middle of the Freedom Ride movement that was started by Core and James Foreman. And the adult leaders of that movement decided at that moment that they were going to stop the freedom rides because of the violence. Those students from Nashville decided that they would take, take over this, this movement at this point. They said, if only we can, uh, can expect and uh, continue to have your support, you don't have to ride, we're gonna ride. And from that moment on, it became a student movement. The next nine students to, to leave Anniston, Alabama, on to uh, Birmingham and Montgomery, where they were bloodied and beaten. Uh, in essence, uh, we would have no movement had it not been for those student leaders. So it's not an accident that we had nine, nine of you today. 
because when we look at uh, the state of race and, and today, I don't, you guys don't need the Pew Research Center to tell you that we still have some problems, but I will read a paragraph from one of their recent studies. It says that a majority of Americans say race relations in the United States are bad. And of those about 70, seven in 10 say things are getting worse. Roughly two thirds say it has become more common for people to express racist or racially insensitive views since Donald Trump was elected, even if not necessarily more acceptable. Opinions about the state of race relations, Trump's handling of the issues and the amount of attention paid to race vary considerably across racial and ethnic groups. Blacks, Hispanics, Asians are more likely than whites to say Trump has made race relations worse. In the last five years, things have gotten worse. I will, I will forego the, uh, but when I will forego that first question we were going to talk about when I asked you to, to, to do further introductions because I think uh, your faculty advisors have done that. But when you begin to ask, answer your first question, um, you can share as a preface to that, to your response, how you're feeling about being among this nine student leaders today. Right? Makes sense? Um, history. Uh, and I said to Dr. Uh, uh, Clyde Robinson that uh, today was the anniversary of Trayvon Martin's killing, but that was, I was looking at February's calendar, February 26, 2012. But when I looked at today's calendar, it didn't make a difference because this is the anniversary of the Scottsboro um, boys uh, issue with those 17 teenagers being sentenced to death for, for rape and right. Yesterday was the anniversary of Viola Liuzzo's killing while she was transporting the student leaders from Montgomery to Selma in 1965, a white mother. Right. So I will ask uh, the, the first question and then I will keep time, three minutes. And the first question is, Dr. Martin Luther King stated, I am convinced that men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other and they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other and they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. Do you agree or disagree and why? And let me start with Kaylin. And then, uh, uh, then uh, after Kaylin, uh, Toya. Well, hello. Thank you for that question, and thank you, Dr. Ishmael, for the amazing bio. Um, I I appreciate you for even inviting me on this platform with amazing student leaders. And yes, we are the hub of student leaders at Dillard University. So thank you. I agree that. Um, with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, quote that, you know, we are separate because of fear, right? Um, when you are afraid of something, or let's, let's just say, with, you know, being black or white, right? A lot of African Americans are being, um, are, are, how do I say this? People don't understand where we come from. People don't understand our background because they don't want to understand. They don't try to understand. And a lot of people are in these spaces to understand. And so I think it's very important when you're talking about different races and coming amongst each other and being together, we have to learn from our lived experiences, right? And what does that look like? Uplifting our experiences, uplifting our lived voices um, and making sure that we are respecting and honoring everyone's past and everyone's even um, our, even our futures, right? So um, like I said, not even to ramble, but I do agree. And it really just takes understanding and taking the time to really sit down and understand. If you wanna be an ally for the black community, you have to understand it's not just putting your fist up and saying black lives matter, right? It's about taking the time to understand the black struggles that we have faced, um, that we have faced for years, years. And that goes with any other, um, any other community of color. So um, thank you for that question, sir. 
And thank you, Kaylin. Before Toya, uh, before you answer or uh, respond, Toya, let me welcome Dr. Brian, uh, Dr. Brian Turner from Xavier University. And Brian, uh, Dr. Turner, we've been waiting for you to introduce Brian and give a short introduction uh, of um, of Brian and um, and Sydney, right? Sydney, you're from Xavier, right? Sydney. All right, Brian, please. Just a short introduction to your students. So, so brother Joe, I really can't. I'm in class, so I'm gonna have to lean to those students introducing themselves, so I could get back to doing duty. I just wanted to pop in and watch and learn, so I don't want to be disrespectful to, to to what I have to do. But I, I gotta get back to class. But I'm on a listen. I'm on my phone. Don't tell anybody, but I'm listening. I just want to pop in. So my apologies. <laughs> All right, no no problem, Dr. Turner. Uh, so. Sydney and Brian, you didn't have a chance to introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. And then of course, then we're moving on to Toya to respond to that first question. So my name is Sydney August. I'm a sophomore psychology pre-med major from Houston, Texas. Um, I'm really honored that Dr. Turner chose me to be a part of this panel because I'm really somebody who is very, very passionate about inclusion of everybody, no matter your gender, your race, your sexuality, whether you have a disability or not, whether you identify as neurodivergent or neuro, um, excuse me, neurotypical. I'm really, really passionate about that. And that's something that I always try to bring forward on campus and in my own personal life. But we had a test today. So that's why, unfortunately, Dr. Turner is not able to join us. Well, we recognize the sacrifices that all of you are making at this point to, to, to jump in on, it, on this important conversation. Um, but okay, so now Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself before we move on with the questions. Huh? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Lewis, and I'm from Xavier University. I'm a sophomore psychology major. And so, again, I would also like to thank Dr. Turner for this opportunity. I've never really done anything like this, talking about racial justice in a panel with other students. And so it interests me because in terms of research, this is kind of my primary area, looking at kind of racial kind of racial issues and how it can affect stress and how that can kind of have effect on people as well. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Now, um, Toya? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Ishmael, for the lovely introduction. And thank you, Mr. Gibbons, for moderating the panel. Um, I'm very happy to be here among like colleagues, among people who are actually going to be the ones who are doing the work, um, leading the people, leading the fight, leading the movement in years to come. I feel like a lot of times these conversations are had by people who are phasing out of the movement, who are phasing out of the work. And so I think it's important that we create space for us and our voices to kind of be uplifted together. Um, to the question, I like the quote, but I think it's important to kind of to put it in context, right? So this particular speech was given at Cornell College, and Cornell College is not a Dillard, a Xavier, um, or a Suno, right? It is a white school, and so um, one of Dr. King's innate gifts, in my opinion, is to be able to like kind of connect and bring people together and to orate to people in such a way that they would understand like, you know, this is this is something I can't relate or experience. Um, but he just had a way of of saying, I mean, we hear we've heard we've all heard his speeches, right? Um, he just had a way of bringing people together with his words. And um, I think that that's what this quote is an example of, right? It's a way that he was illustrating to a group of white people, this is what we have, this, this is what our struggle is, this is what could bring us together. Now, I think when we're having real conversations about like, why are we separated from each other? Why do men truly hate each other? I don't think it's because we don't understand each other, because we're separated from each other, because we don't communicate. Um, I don't think it's because of any of that, but I think that that's the kind of language sometimes that's used to, um, to gain allyship, right? To like bring, draw people into the space comfortably and say like, all right, now we're in it together. Now that I have your buy-in, let, let's, let's narrow down exactly what the plight of the people is, exactly what we need to do. So um, I like the quote, but I don't think that that's like a true, a true reflection of why do we, why is there hate in our world? Like, why is there hate between each other? Thank you. Thank you, Toya. Uh, you you got me on the edge of my seat now. I'm I'm trying to figure out what. So, uh, 
if you don't mind me asking a, a follow-up question, okay, if it's not fear, then what is it? Um, I, I think that well, this at the bottom nothing, there is the nothing point. that is like, that is broken or, or wrong about kind of what's going on, right? Like everything was created to be this way. Like this, historically things have been put in place, like Caitlin was saying earlier, um, like there are historical barriers and things that have been put in place before this moment right now, right? So we talk about like the movement is like, it's fearing up, like we're about to turn a corner. And it's like, uh, when you look back in history, you see that like, this is not the first moment like this, right? Like this is not there really aren't that many firsts that are happening you know and so I don't think that it's um, I don't think that it's fear what I think it is it's just a lack of of education of knowledge right we try to like put a little a pretty a pretty name and um and picture on it you know we talk about like intersectionality and say okay we're going to bring people to the table but then we don't actually operationalize diversity equity and inclusion practices in our work right so I think maybe I don't know what to call that, you know, um, the white man. Well, so when you heard that 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 phone thing, this is my first attempt. Listen, I'm I'm, I'm learning how to do this this stuff. <laughs> that's right. Look, uh, I set a timer, right? So when you hear the ding, 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 that's that's the time of thing going on. So okay, let's move on to uh, uh, let's ask Jamal that like, same question. Jamal, your turn to respond. Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson, for inviting me, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Gibbons, for having me here. Uh, it's good to meet all of you all. Um, to me, well, Dr. Keene at the time was being very uh, idealistic and uh, when he made that statement. And so I, I think we all agree, as, as Toya has just said, that he, Dr. Keene was a brilliant orator and a very even tipper man and uh, scholar. Uh, but he later on, later on throughout the years, he had a different view about integration. And he even said that he feared that he was integrating his people into a burning house. <clears throat> but to answer the question about whether or not I feel that we need, what is it, communicate with each other a little bit more due to, due to uh, being separated. I think about us being in New Orleans and we tend to tout that we are gumble and being a gumbo, uh, each ingredient has its own texture or whatnot, you know. But the truth is, uh, if we're honest with each other, I don't think that we are a, a true gumbo because a good gumbo has that flavor throughout that roux. And so when I'm tasting that gumbo and when I'm tasting that shrimp, I can also taste a little bit of that hot sausage, you know what I mean? And so we should all, that, that rising tide should all be as one. And so having that flavor within each other Yes, there has to be this inter integrate, uh, in, uh, where we integrate with one another, but I think we need to look at it more realistically and not tout that we are gumbles, but we should look at ourselves more like a, 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 a plate that has the chicken, the cornbread and whatnot. And so I'm gonna eat the different, the, the separate things and not actually as one in that feeling, you know? Yeah, you, you you made me hungry, man. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's something that you can you remember. Know, That's why and, I was know, to find and Dr. Like and Dr. Alcazar can make he makes one of them. look. I grew up in New Orleans in the little night walk. Where, yes. Uh, look, Al, Al Alcazar up there uh, can make one of the best gumbos I've ever, ever tasted. I had to bring it. But anyway, thank you yeah. for your thank you for your your comment. And let us let's now move well. to. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Sid, uh, Sid, Sydney August, please. Hi, I agree with what Toya said earlier about how a lot of these things with people being separated is deeply rooted into historical um, setups that have created the, this division. And I also think that in modern day terms, we can look at the media as also being another outlet for people to cause more separations. You know, we have TV shows and movies that depict minorities in negative ways and negative stereotypes. And you have audiences who watch this and they believe that, you know, people like me, people like you possess these negative stereotypes and they automatically judge us without actually getting the chance to truly know us and who we are and where our background from. So although I think Dr. King was really, you know, trying to connect with, connect all the cultures together, I think that 
in modern day terms, it's more than just us not communicating with each other and having a fear of communicating with each other. I think that society as a whole and what we see and what we're fed to on the news and um, in the media also plays a huge role in that. Well, Cindy, you've got two minutes, you've got two minutes left and it gives me a chance to ask a follow-up question. So when you talk about, and when Toya was talking about this, is this a good illustration of what we're often talking about when we're talking about systemic, systemic racism, this, the, how it's built into the system, whether we're looking at television, we're looking at in schools, or is this an example of what we're talking about when we say systemic racism? Yes, sir. I think it's, just, it's all about systemic racism. racism. Okay. Um, so you guys are going to open it up for some great uh, chat questions, but let me go to, let me ask uh, while we're at Xavier University, Brian, you ready to, uh, to share your thoughts about uh, that question? Yes, sir. And so I as well agree with, Toy with Ms. Toya Smith, but I also want to look at it as when you think of racial justice, kind of like Martin Luther King said, where everything kind of comes from, I do think that fear actually does play a major factor, at least in the reaction and how you act on those racist decisions. And so the example I would like to use is Dylan Roof with his shooting. When you look into kind of what happened with that whole situation, he was someone who ended up shooting up the church. If you kind of look into it, you see he went into a rabbit hole of which he kind of saw this anti-Black propaganda. And so that built up a level of fear in him to cause him to act on that hatred that is present. And so then the next part, everything about communication as well, and us being separated, is very unlikely that Dylan Roof knew many black people to kind of build off of, to kind of get an opinion on besides everything he's seen. And so I do think that separation does play a major part in why people kind of don't understand each other. And that builds off of what Sydney said, because that's media. That's kind of everything that we see every day that if you don't get personal experience with certain group of people that you kind of have to build off of what you hear and only hear. And then that leads to you just building your, all of your information that you know off of information that's given to you, whether it is false or true. Thank you, Brian. Um, we're moving right along. Let's go to Sydney and, and um, Sydney, what are you thinking? Can you hear me? I just wanna make sure my internet's good. Yeah, good, good. Okay, go ahead, cool. Sydney. It wasn't working earlier. Okay. Um, First of all, thank you to Professor Gibbons and all the other panelists. It's an honor to actually be here with you guys and I'm going to enjoy learning a lot. Um, as far as the question goes, I can agree that there's a fear to the unknown, especially when we look at this older generation that we're dealing with right now. They don't want to learn new tricks. It's, you know, like the saying goes, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. So it's, when you're looking at it at a racial standpoint, they already have this instilled fear that they were brought up with and that they're still continuing to see in the media and their media outlets, their friends. And it's turning into this problem of people aren't being taught the things that they don't know, essentially. You, if you're not taught it, how are you supposed to know that not to be afraid of it? And so it's going back to being opening up a conversation between people, opening up a conversation between people you don't know and making sure that those lessons are taught at a young age. And unfortunately, they weren't taught to that older generation. And when you have start having that trickle down effect, we start seeing this instilled fear that we have in some people now. So I think um, I can agree that there's a fear of the unknown, but I can also agree that you have to be open to having a conversation. You have to be open to learning new opinions, new objectives to everything. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, and I want to, at this, at this point, I should have mentioned this to Dr. Alcazar and Dr. Robinson, uh, Dr. Ishmael, if you, if you have a follow-up question or want to pursue uh, any line of, of response, please, 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 uh, please do so. All right. 
Um, thank you, Sydney. Let's uh, let me let me uh, let me say this before I, I ask uh, ask Ethan. I selected uh, 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 Sydney and and Layla, um, and Layla will come after Ethan. But on the night after those Asian uh, women were, were killed in Atlanta, Ethan called me uh, and asked me if we were still going to pursue uh, uh, any discussions around racial justice and racial issues at, uh, at Loyola. And then I felt that I'd made a critical error in not inviting uh, 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 expanding this discussion of nine students to also include a, uh, Asian, Asian students and Asian brothers and sisters. So I want to thank Ethan for, for joining in this conversation. And Ethan, why don't you address that question that everyone has been addressing so far? Okay. Well, um, if I may introduce myself, and first of all, thank you, Professor Gibbons, for having me here also. And thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. For yeah, thank you, Dr. Al, for introducing me. But uh, my name is Ethan D. I am an honors commu uh, computer science major in my junior year, attending Loyola University. Sorry, I am a 21-year-old Asian American, half Filipino, half Chinese. I was raised in Cebu, Philippines, for 13 years until my family moved to New Orleans. I have lived in New Orleans for eight years now, having attended public school before Loyola. I am not a person who is normally active with student government or that sort of thing, but I am very concerned about uh, racial justice and inclusion. So at the very least, I hope that my, my statements act as another, another perspective, as a foreigner's perspective. In regards to Dr. King's statement, I wholeheartedly agree. Dr. King hit the nail on the head. You can see this from the shootings in Atlanta last week. I believe that the violence stemmed from separation. Even if the 21 year old suspect's actions were blamed on sex addiction, quote unquote, and or mental illness altogether, I still wonder why the incident occurred at three different spas. And I believe it's reasonable to think that this was a hate crime. With eight people dead, six of them Asian women and another injured. The shooting happened at spas and these people were unknown before then. So how could anyone think otherwise? And so it leads me to wonder where this stems from. And given the social climate, it's easy to fear Asian Americans, or well, Asian people, American or not. The use of terms like Chinese virus, Kung flu, and all the other variations are proof enough of the situation. What is difficult today is developing a loving understanding for one another, no matter who you are. The America we live in today is too separated to prevent the formation of hatred. I wholeheartedly believe that. And although we may live in better times than 60 years ago, hatred persists in young America today. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. And finally, on uh, this question, Layla, Layla Jones, Talk to us. Um, Tell us what you're thinking. Yeah, and we also have Hannah after me. Um, but for me, I think that uh, as a history major, I think the institutions that have historically oppressed uh, BIPOC people um, are definitely built off of ignorance. They're built off of fear. They're built off of hatred. And I think all three of those things go together. Um, I think that if you don't know something, if you don't try to pursue something, such as the lived experiences of BIPOC people, then you will never learn to move past an ignorance, and you might develop a hatred, you might develop an anger that leads to such actions as the shooting uh, Ethan mentioned, um, and it, the sh shooting that Brian also mentioned, which were both racially motivated. Um, and I think it's important to address the fact that, like, even today, young people still self-segregate. Um, we have the tendency to become so involved with only one racial group that we don't expand past that circle. 
that we are afraid of potentially getting hurt from the BIPOC side of things, where there's a fear that if you do go outside of that bubble, there is the risk of facing those racist repercussions. Um, and then I think on the white side of things, it's the fear of the unknown of, you know, the, the, if you have not had the experience of reaching out to someone who is not a part of your own cultural group or cultural identity, then you're not truly making the reach to truly like develop a sense of understanding um, regarding racial experiences and racial justice. And if we're not targeting the oppression by teaching each other and by relying on each other, then there's not going to be progress and the self-segregation, this hatred, this ignorance is going to continue, um, which is horrible. So that's my, in short, I agree with King <laughs> on a certain level and I think it contributes to those other pieces that I talked about. Finally, on this question, Hannah Littlefield, tell us what you're thinking. Hello, my name is Hannah Littlefield. Thank you everyone for including me in this conversation. Um, my major is music therapy. So I oftentimes find it very hard to stand out about my own stances on these type of issues because as somebody studying to be a therapist, you're expected to obviously include everyone and validate everyone, no matter if you agree or not. So it's oftentimes very hard um, studying in this field to step out and make a declarative statement about what I believe or what I need to say. So this is a really great platform for that. Um, I just wanted to mention that at the beginning of our community organizing class, we were asked to speak with um, peers about what gets us, what keeps us up at night, what makes us um, feel a certain sense of injustice. And we were all called out by uh, Professor Givens because we were at the beginning really only talking to our friends and people that we were really close with. And that really opened my eyes. I think that is, the caveat that I have to Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, speech or this quote from his speech is that, yes, we are separated, but that like Layla was saying can be due to our own choice or due to our own fear of stepping out. And I myself am definitely, um, definitely a perpetrator of this, just talking to people I know will either agree with me or people I already know align with me, talking to those kind of people, it's a lot harder to go out and talk to somebody who might, you know, not be able to understand when you, where you're coming from, but it's still very important to go out and have those conversations with people who don't align with you or don't support the same political leaders or don't support the same movements that you do because how is any conversation gonna happen if we're just talking to people who already agree? It's, you know, we're not changing anything. They already get it, you know? If I go and talk to my best friend who is a very love, like has a passion for going to protests and, you know, just anything like that, it's not gonna move us forward. Um, it's talking to people with love, you know, like I don't agree with say like my mother, and for my whole life, I spent time, you know, just living in my shell because I didn't want to fight with her. But I learned, you know, it doesn't have to be a fight, but it, there needs to be a conversation. Um, so I think that's what I got most from this. Well, you, time, you timed that perfect, perfect. So let me ask Dr. Uh, Ishmael, um, we want to, right now we're at uh, 10 minutes to two, we want to stick with the, uh, with, uh, and you know, we're talking about 2.30, is it? Yes. yes. 2.30? Well, then I'm, a, I'm going to, I'm going to move this to two minutes per, per question. All right. Okay. So the second question is, 
Uh, John Powell, Professor of Law and African American Studies and Chair in Equity and Inclusion at UC Berkeley, has stated in his essay, Moving Beyond the Isolated Self, that racial justice is about claiming a shared mutual humanity. Do you agree, disagree, or why, and why? Uh, let's start with, uh, let's again start with uh, Kaylin. Okay, thank you again for that question. Um, um, like, like Dr. Ishmael said in my bio, I am a reproductive justice uh, advocate. Like this is what I wanna do. This is my life's work, this is my passion. So when thinking about um, this question, I immediately thought about the injustices that black women face every single day regarding their health. And, um, and so that's kind of how I was thinking. So in my perspective, it's, it's um, yes, I do agree with this question, with this statement, but I believe it's because not everyone can see each other as being equal human beings. Um, as an African-American woman who has dealt with um, injustices, reproductive just like reproductive injustices, um, my pain wasn't even wasn't even um, enough for people, right? It was, oh, you're over-exaggerating. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm a professional. Um, I know that your pain is not, you know, it's not a 10 like you're saying it is, right? Just go home. And then I come back and you still don't want to do the test because I may not have, you know, I may not have private insurance or I may not be able to pay for the different testing and stuff like that. So just putting that in perspective, I just think um, it goes back to to educating, right? It's, it goes back to that lack of knowledge that people have about other people's lived experiences. So when you think that someone isn't as human as you, doesn't feel as much pain as you, that's ignorance because you have not allowed yourself to, to expand on different people's perspectives or livelihoods, if that makes sense. So that's just a different perspective that I want to take um, on that question. Jamal, why don't you go next, please? Um, I agree with it, but I agree with it. But first, uh, we all have to just recognize each other's humanity. Uh, and you cannot marginalize a community. Uh, you have to be intentional about seeking out each other's humanity. You know, um, and to marginalize, I mean, you know, specifically just disregard people. Uh, I think about one of the books I've read, one one hundred years of uh, lynching, and there would be people who would go into the jail cells. Uh, take out individuals based on just the statement of a few. And there would be vigilantes, you know, they didn't go to court or whatnot, burn them to the state, throw some water on them and burn them again. Uh, and this type of justice has been going on still even to this day. That was something recently uh, MSNBC uh, was doing a, a special about the, the, the young lady, I, I can't think of a name right now, but that's trying to get sworn in uh, as, as the third, uh, what, what is it called, attorney general? And she was doing, she, she, as, at the time, she was an NAACP lawyer. And you can see that this, this one individual touted, and if y'all all saw it on MSNBC, but his words grabbed and sentenced basically 10%, 13% of this black community, and all of them went to jail. And it, it took her to come there and fight. And this was happening even still today. And these, these things have not changed. And so when we talk about racial just, justice, you know, we have to first recognize me as a human being. And you can't put your knee on my neck for eight minutes and, and be in front of a camera and feel comfortable about that. There's something wrong about that. That means I don't see you as a human being. It's like Ethan just said, you know, when you've seen someone that does not look like me and you can just take a life, I don't even know you, then you know it's a hate crime, right? And so it's important for us first to be intentional, to go out on a limb, to have conversations with people who first don't even look like me. Jamal, right on time, brother. <laughs> uh, hey, you guys, you guys got an internal clocks, right? All right, so, um, so uh, let's, uh, let's go to Sydney, uh, Sydney August from Xavier University. Sydney, go ahead, why don't you tell us what you think about that question? I agree with this, with um, his statement. You know, I, I was, ooh, I'm sorry. I was blessed to attend, um, but upon going to Xavier, predominantly white high school, middle school, elementary school. So I've been a part of communities where 
able to achieve racial racial justice and a mutual shared humanity. However, I will say that I feel that if it weren't for me being the minority in those spaces and being able to have those uncomfortable conversations with my peers in class discussions, I don't think that these I don't think that a shared mutual respect would be attainable because sometimes ignorance is bliss. And sometimes if you don't know better, you don't do better. And I think that once there were people who looked like me, there were Asian people, like Latinx people to have those conversations with these people, we were able to see, hey, we had some things in common. We can agree on these things and we can learn how to um, become one and unify and be able to share a space together. So I do agree with his statement. So, uh, you know what, you would make, you should make me think about Sufi when you, when you say that, uh, that ignorance is bliss. And so since there might, must be a truly a, a lot of happy people in this country, right? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, Sydney, why don't you, why don't you uh, Share your thoughts on that question, please. Sydney Rockwell. Sure, and um, if I could take what Kaylin said and just ditto it, that would be wonderful because I think she like spot on, completely spot on. Um, I agree with the statement. And I think that, you know, like we've all been saying, the problem that we're seeing is just a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding and a lack of people communicating and it's trying to find a way to like branch those people who are refusing. You're, free, you're freezing up, Sydney. Communicate. And get them to communicate and understand us as people. Can you uh, hear me? Hello? No, you're freezing up pretty bad here. Um, I know you have some uh, some time left. Why don't you try to continue? We got about a minute or so. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hope you can hear me. But if you can't, all I was saying was that I think us as leaders need to drive that uh, force of communication, and um, we can do that by making sure that we're doing it ourselves. And I'll just end with that since my kids. Internet spotting. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, Sydney. Um, Toya, what are you thinking? Um, I'm thinking that it is definitely important to acknowledge um, each other's humanity, and I think that that's something that we don't do. But I don't think that it's something that we don't do. I feel like it's important to kind of like have context even in that, right? Like when we, it's not that we don't acknowledge each other's humanity because I'm like, uh, all right, Kaylin, like, I just, I just, I just don't like you. You know, like they're like deep, like subconscious things that play into um, the way that we like treat each other and see each other. You know, it's the same reason why Jamal referenced the video of, of, of some of what happened, like that bad murder is like, it is, was allowed to happen, why it was okay. You know, why we had white people storm the Capitol and it was like, oh yeah, y'all can just hang out here, no big deal. So um, I feel like, you know, it is important to have that shared humanity, but like how achievable it is, like, you know, I think is, um, I think like a deeper discussion. Um, and two, I think that to John A. Powell's credit, you know, he is a, he's a professor at Berkeley and he has a lot of work in writings and dealing with like a wide variety of students. Um, Berkeley is not a school that has just one kind of student, has like a widespread, um, so anyways, in that entire journal, he talks about all um, a, a range of how we can respect each other's humanity from like white people acknowledging white privilege to um, like looking past like this, um, this like narrative of people being, I don't know, I guess it's just like a whole lot of different academic ways to say racist, um, but it is really interesting and I would encourage reading it even further. Thank you, Talia. Um, and now, Ethan. Ethan, 
What are you thinking about this question? Okay. Uh, though I have not read Professor Powell's essay to fully understand the context of his statement, I do think that his statement, racial justice is about claiming a shared mutual humanity is true. However, the issue becomes recognizing that a shared mutual humanity has not been fully claimed. It is an impossibility to claim a shared mutual humanity without being mutual nor sharing. Plenty of people in this country believe that the civil rights work has been finished and everyone is on the same playing field. The people who carry this misguided belief are led to ignorance and hatred for those who don't do the right thing by their standards. Hatred for people who don't act like they do. For example, I personally know people who hate the Black Lives Matter movement. They see a movement for social justice as a movement of rioters and looters, domestic terrorists. They read a call for humanity to mean a call for subjugation. And yet I have seen these indiv individuals inadvertently claim to have a shared mutual humanity. And though the people I'm referring to are older than me, the fact that they receive a large amount of their information from social media strongly suggests that this issue is still persistent today with our generation. Without the ability to empathize and understand one another, there is no way to claim a true shared mutual humanity nor develop racial justice. We will get nowhere if we do not value sharing our experiences with each other. If we do not seek to understand one another, we do not seek unity. We have to be avid learners of our differences and nurture each other with our similarities. Today, we need ways to come together. Thank you, Ethan. And um, Leila, what are you thinking about this question? So when I first read it, I was kind of in the position where I was like, uh, I, I don't know if I agree, but I'll expand on that because I think that a lot of the time from uh, white individuals, you hear the idea that we're in a post-racial America, that uh, we're all the one race, the human race, um, and ideas of like, I don't see color which while I think the ultimate end goal is that we can believe in a shared humanity, I think there's the issue of that right now, a lot of people aren't able to reach that point even of recognizing how identity and marginalization and oppression affects communities of color. Um, and so we can't even reach that point of a shared humanity currently. So it's a lot about um, before we can get there, we have to just reach a shared communication, a shared playing field of where we can talk about race and open communicative spaces like this, for example, um, because if we're not doing that, um, then that shared humanity will not be recognized. And that goes back again to historical systems of segregation and pushing people away and not allowing that communication to happen. Um, and the type of things and stereotypes you hear thrown around in certain groups are horrific. Um, a lot of the time towards communities of color it dehumanizes us ridiculously. Um, and so it's important that communities of color are able to reach out to white individuals and say, this is how you, you've seen us, you've treated us um, as less than human and we deserve to be seen as human um, and have those con difficult conversations. Um, and I think just quickly, if I have time, that the idea that we are in a post-racial America is really harmful. And it's something that's kind of a rhetoric of a lot of young people, I think, after seeing, for example, Obama's presidency, a lot of my white friends back home suddenly are like, oh, Trump just made it worse for a while. Now that we're with Joe Biden again, it'll go back to how it was when Obama was president. But I don't think that that's the case. I think that it's an ignorance again of racial issues and racial discrimination in the country that happened even during Obama's presidency. Um, so it just, again, we need to first be able to have these conversations before we can even get to that shared humanity. Thank you, Layla. And finally, uh, on this question, Brian. Okay, so I kind of want to build off of what Layla said because I had a similar thought process. This kind of brought me into that 
thought of the colorblind theory. And so the issue with, for me, with kind of this statement is that it is very important to recognize that, of course, shared mutual humanity is important, but that is a stepping stone because right now what you're trying to do is, and I don't think this is a bad thing, you're focusing on the soul similarities between us, the fact that we're all humans, things like that. But at times that can actually lead to us ignoring an important aspect in that there are differences between people. And so the reason why I brought up the colorblind issue is because a lot of times that's kind of their main argument, the whole we're all humans, things like that. And the issue with that is that, okay, I understand that, but if you don't accept the fact that I'm different, even if you believe that I'm a human, you're still, when you first see me, you're still going to see the color of my skin. That's never going to change. You're still going to see those different features. And then even when you look at kind of the effect that, that, that it has on minorities, it's shown that that whole thought of we're all humans ignoring differences harms, harms us because we think of it as you're not only are you not individualizing me, you're taking away a part of me that's important to me. Brian, thank you. Uh, Hannah, you have the last word on this question and we'll move on to the next. Um, everything that everyone brought to the table just really makes me think about how complex this, um, this question or statement really is because yes, while ideally the mutual, <clears throat> like mutual living between all races, that is the goal, but at the same time, there are a lot of things that need to happen that aren't just mental or aren't just um, verbal, you know, such as redistribution of wealth, goods, services, um, and as well as um, creating and re reassigning opportunities to people who, like to everyone. And it's, while it seems like, yes, it'd be great for everyone to live in this mutual, we're all we're all even on the same playing field. There is that systemic racism piece that plays in that needs to be broken down. And before we can ever begin to think that, that, that mutual living would happen, as well as the idea that um, um, while there is like this need for communication, it kind of goes into that colorblind piece, how we, tend to disregard people's pain kind of like Kaylin was talking about just because say we don't understand how to validate that because it hasn't happened to us necessarily so it's it's hard we need to create some sort of um working definition of what mutual is or what sharing looks like or what you know communication even looks like because to me Communication looks like Kaylin comes to me and says, you know, I'm really experiencing this problem. And I'm not going to say, oh, you know, well, it's not that bad because I had something worse happen or, oh, you know, the same thing happened to me. You know, it's like some people don't need to hear that. They need to hear, I'm so sorry. I have never been through that, but here's how I want to care for you or how can I care for you? What is the best way? What do you need? not, oh, this is me implying my, or imposing my own ideas about what's gonna help you or what's gonna make you feel better. It's, it, we need to come from a place of, what do you need? What, where are you? Meeting people where they're at. Um, so like I said, there needs to be some sort of running definition that we can all apply because communication looks, effective communication looks so different for everyone. I have time, Hannah. So, uh, so Joe, may, may I say something, please? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Alcazar. I just want to point out, and I think Brian Lewis used the term colorblind. Um, I make sure in my classes that especially my white students and my Asian students and my Latino students know that there is no such thing as a colorblind approach that works. Colorblind approach is a big 
huge lie. There is no such thing. Colorblind is a cover for racism. So there is no colorblind. Anyone who says colorblind works is lying to you. So Brian, thank you for bringing this up. There is no such thing as colorblind, okay? I can't emphasize that enough. The reason that also, I want to say that the reason that we can't really say there is such a thing as full humanity today is because the humanity of our African brothers and sisters of our black brothers and sisters have been denied since 1619, okay? We were taught about the Mayflower that arrived, but we were never taught about the white lion that arrived here in August of 1619 that brought stolen uh, African brothers and sisters on a ship, okay? The reason that we can't really talk about full humanity today is because the humanity of our African brothers and sisters have been denied for over 400 years until we can restore that. There is no such thing as full humanity. I just wanna add that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alcazar. Let me say this is the, the last question. And I think it is perhaps the most important question because uh, the Center for Racial Justice was not established for a, as a place for a discussion. It was a, uh, you could very well have placed the Center for Racial Justice and Action beyond that, Dr. Dr. Uh, Ishmael, because that was, this is no, uh, we didn't intend this conversation to be uh, a philosophical or theoretical conversation, even though um, it could very well be. But our hope was that it was going to evolve. And that's why I was so adamant all through this process that we had nine students that represented in mirror image, the nine students who did so much to place, uh, to bring us, you know, 60 years ago, those nine students looked like you. I mean, they looked just like you. And now they look like, now they look like me and Alvaro, right? Uh, and it really is truly your turn, your turn to, you're not the leaders of, of tomorrow, you're the leaders of today and what you do today affects affects the future. So this last question, this last question is intended for, uh, you know, well, I'm, we're hoping, and I would just say, say this, Dr. Alcazar, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Ashraf, Ishmael, and I, uh, in our classes three years ago, we brought together what, 400 students, who uh, challenged uh, Desiree Charbonnet and Latoya Cantrell when they were running for mayor. And these students came from Dillard University, from Southern University, from Loyola University, uh, from Xavier University, and created a platform that they presented to the mayor. Uh, we followed up with follow-up actions with the mayor at Southern University, Dr. Clyde Robinson, right? And um, so, we have hopes and visions and dreams of your leadership and you moving this thing beyond today. So the last question, uh, and again, we start with Kaylin. And what is this past summer's global demonstrations that an increasing number of people of all races, creeds and colors wanna see an interracial injustice? <laughs> if we agree uh, that hatred that uh, would King's uh, statement that hatred and division is a product of fear or lack of leadership or lack of relationship. If we agree with some of the things that we've said here, that's not contained in that in that uh, in that statement about the historical nature of this 
about the history of it, about the systemic nature of it, and about your role and where you are as student leaders at this point, as young leaders that's gonna move this thing forward. What should be our next steps? What should be your next steps um, in assuming your leadership now as, as the leaders of today? What's your next step? And let me start with uh, Kaylin again. Kaylin, go ahead. Okay, great. So um, as we're wrapping this up, we talked about the lack of knowledge, right? Um, people not understanding um, others, and that's why we're, we all don't have like racial justice and humanity. Um, but I was thinking about the implicit biases that we have amongst each other, right? And people that don't even look like us in different communities, and it could be communities of color as well. So really for me and, um, and for student leaders that I'm around, um, I always advocate to make sure that we are addressing um, the elephant in the room. So addressing the implicit biases that we have amongst each other and then going ahead and educating each other. And like I said before, uplifting those lived experiences and voices of others. Um, so that's super important when we talk about actually moving forward, right? And, um, and so, yeah, like I just, I always challenge people to say, hey, you may say, oh, I'm not racist. I'm not this, I'm not that. But the thing is, you can say that, but it's, it's, it's taught. It really is taught at an early age. And that's, that's, that's when you end up identifying those implicit biases that you have. So it's important to say, hey, here's an indicator of the, that implicit bias I had based off the Asian community or the um, Hispanic community or even the white community. And then saying, you know, now let me dial back and see why I even had that implicit bias to, to, to begin with. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, Let's stay with the same order of things. And I think, who do we have uh, after that? Was it Jamal? Yeah, it's Professor Gibbons. Jamal. Um, okay. Uh, well, let me first address the, the context and the framing of the question that suggests that global demonstrations prove that there's an increasing number of people of all races and creeds and colors that want to see an end to racial injustice. And, uh, and I'm concerned about that because I think that we have to fine tune the narrative uh, before we can attempt to answer the question itself. Uh, I viewed the demonstrations and from the fact that I said viewed in past tense, it should be recognized, but that's exactly what it felt like to me, just a demonstration. And I can remember when I was in karate, uh, we used to do things that we used to call it a kata. A kata is when you, you do a, a demonstration. If you ever was in karate as a kid and you would chop the air and make a loud noise, right? And that's the way sometimes I look at a demonstration. A demonstration is a lot of noise, a lot of swinging at the air, but we have to be a little bit more effective when it comes to demonstrations because some people will get those awards and leave, but I would stand and do what they call the fight after that. So I would leave with two trophies from the kind of demonstration and also knowing that I was effective. And so we need to use those same techniques to defend and uplift ourselves and turn that into policies and social conditions and health conditions uh, and economic conditions. And we cannot just use hashtags that say BL, BLM or whatnot, but we have to be seriously committed to change. And like I said earlier, I think that that was start by making friends with people who may not look like one another, may not sound like us and you know, going outside of our comfort zone. So I'm glad to meet every last one of you guys today. Thank you. So let me say that I owe Kayla and I owe you another minute. <laughs> Kayla, no you, I, look, I look you. I like what you're talking about. So you know, you got another minute to share some of your your feelings and thoughts on this. Go ahead, Kayla. <laughs> no, maybe so you said I'm, it all. Maybe you said it all. I don't know. I said it all, but thank you. But thank you for giving my extra minute. I will give my extra minute to someone else. Thank all you. Right. <laughs> all right. Okay. So let's go on to uh, so Ethan. Ethan, one of why don't you go now? And what should be the next steps? Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to preface this with Kaylin. I think you you made an excellent point about uh, diminishing bias, getting rid of our bias. But we also need more ways to, to do that inherently. We have to value speaking with people who are not like ourselves. 
as people, we need to recognize that we are erroneous pattern seekers and our notions of others are biased and we have to seek to break that. We need to gather together more. I recognize the value of having platforms and protests to speak out against oppression, but these only do so much. For instance, the words we the panelists speak today are only reaching those who have put time aside to listen to what we have to say. And those who choose to ignore others' concerns may never hear the messages they need to hear. We need better ways to share our experiences. I also recognize the importance of safe spaces to discuss our struggles and to find belonging but this does not tackle the issue of not knowing each other. Safe spaces keep us safely separated. As students, we need more spaces to come together no matter who we are. We need the ability to be an inherently inclusive community and we must show that we value each other. To me, in terms of facilities and organizations, this means recreational centers and clubs, things that bring people together out of interest, for example, clubs for TV shows, movies, video games, and every other activity that we can share. Whatever brings people together to share a common interest so that we can develop relationships with one another. In terms of individual students, what you and I can do better alone. This means getting to know each other, sharing food, playing games, study groups, coffee breaks, lunch dates, social gatherings, parties, you name it. We have to no longer be strangers. Admittedly, this is much more difficult to facilitate today given the pandemic, but the need for inclusivity is still there. If we can only be with each other online, then so be it. We need to make time for each other to combat our separation. Thank you, Ethan. And let's go to Sydney August, please. Sydney. I agree um, with what Hannah had mentioned earlier about that the solution is more than just having a conversation um, with other people. I think that it does begin in our systematic institution in the government. And I think that as long as there are people like Donald Trump and other enablers and white supremacists that hold power positions, then racial injustice may never be seen or achieved. And I think that as long as these people are able to block legislation that benefits, that benefits minorities and influence and rewards racists for their hate crimes, then, then racial justice may always still be the fight that we're always going to keep fighting. As far as us as students, I think that we can combat this by getting involved on campus with and other organizations, like Ethan said, and not just sticking to our own race, but um, networking with individuals in our own majors and and organizations that don't look like this so that maybe when we get into the workforce we'll feel comfortable with hiring people that don't look like us we'll feel comfortable with collaborating collaborating with people that don't look like us so that way we can work towards having a government and institutions that include everyone and not just people that look like us thank you Sydney. you got 50 seconds left you want to expound on any of that uh, I've, I've said what i had to say I love it. Okay, so next, uh, Sydney Rockwell. Go ahead, Sydney. So I think I can try to piece together what everyone has said. And I think um, on a micro level, on our level within New Orleans, something that we could do, and this kind of goes off something that Professor Gibbons and I have been talking about, but um, doing some sort of organization campaign where we bring together leaders within New Orleans and have these conversations, have conversations like we're having today uh, with that safe space where people can talk. And I think that'd be something important that we should look into doing um, and organizing together, whether it be in the summer, in the fall, whether it's just us, whether it's 50 more leaders with, from within our schools, I think that's something we should do. And I think that's something that should be done across the country. I mean, that's how you bring people together is you put them in the situation and you get them to communicate. So I think we can start by leading by example. Like I was trying to say, I know my internet's a little spotty. And um, that was what I was trying to say in my second question or my second answer. So I think by us communicating with each other, we can show others how to communicate with each other. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, and now we, we're almost, almost there, Toya. You wanna to share your thoughts on that last question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that there are a lot, there are so many things that kind of like pour into our perspective um, 
social media, like we're the generation that has grown up with technology all the way from pretty much our whole lives. Um, and I think that a lot of those pressures cause people to kind of move towards like, what is everybody else doing, right? Like there's, I see that there's something happening in the community of people who look like me. What do I do? Okay, well, everybody else is out protesting and rallying. Okay, let me do that. But, you know, that might not be your place in the movement, right? That might not be what you have the most to offer. And so I think that there needs to be more of like, what do I care about? You know, like, what do I really enjoy? Um, that's something that I think Kaylin and I have did whenever we first got on campus. And now like you just see like Kaylin is this like magnificent reproductive justice, reproductive health, like women's health advocate. But all of that was because she took the time to figure out like, what is it that I really care about? And now like in that field, she's gonna go and do amazing things, you know, like that matters to me, but that's not like my passion. That's not the thing that, that burns me up inside or keeps me up at night. And so I think as corny as it sounds, um, we need to create more spaces for people to figure out what is that, you know? Um, and people just need to be honest with themselves about what do they care about, even if it doesn't seem like the coolest thing, you know? Because nobody can do you better than you. Thank you, Toya. Uh, and now Layla. So I am definitely uh, kind of hearing this pattern of conversations and the need to facilitate them. And I think that, first of all, a coalition of leaders who are able to talk together, um, who are able to research together, who are able to go up to um, different community and political leaders and say, hey, this is what we need. This is what we need to do um, to make the community a better place, a safer place, a more com a space that's more communicative. Um, and so I think it's important that we all are able to have more conversations like these, to have um, more people getting together. Um, and I think another piece of it is that we need to develop um, more spaces where voices can be lifted up that are not of the white cis het norm um, and be able to have those voices be heard, to have those voices create change. Um, I'm a big proponent of the system we currently have in place today. Universities and government is built off of these racist institutions. And I think it's really hard to reform them. I think there's more value in perhaps rebuilding them from the ground up perhaps, which takes voices like ours to say, this is what's wrong with these systems. This is a system that would work better to truly encourage uh, inclusion, diversity, to include racial justice as a proponent. Um, and so, those are just some like some ideas coming off of that but mainly like something we can do more immediately is obviously keep having things like this talking to each other building with each other thank you Layla um and now Brian okay I agree with everything that's been said, but I kind of want to take a different approach to this. One of the most important things that I feel is important, especially in building interracial relationships, that you first have to have intra-racial relationships. And what I mean is that if you think about it, if we if our interracial relationships, so our relationship within races is kind of fragmented, we kind of have a lot of issues that we have to fix ourselves, how can you actually build those interracial relationships? Because if you can't really get along, kind of accept your own group of people, it's gonna be much harder to do that with a different group of people. And another specific thing that I think is very important, and I will say this is more directed towards white people, is that, cause I see this on social media, people talking about, I hate I'm white, I hate being a white person, things like that, and kind of like trying to help us with our situation, is that I would really like them to refrain from that. Mainly because I've seen how people that don't agree with our stance take those turns and kind of use that to just take away what we're saying to kind of say we're trying to get equality, but then they use those, they cherry pick things that they see like that, and then they use that in a way to say that instead of looking for equality, we're looking for being better, we're looking for white hate, things like that. And I think it's really important that if we are to move on, 
that we kind of have to accept who we are and stop hating on who we are in general for everybody just because in that way, A, people won't be able to lie and take what we say out of context. And two, building those relationships within ourselves will help us build relationships with others. And lastly, Hannah. I wanted to say that when Toya was talking about how people show up to, you know, say protests or um, just different actions um, because they feel that maybe they have to or that they have no other place in the movement. Um, that really, that's something I've been talking to a lot of my friends about and um, beyond my friends really. Um, is about finding your true place, your true passion in the movement and within the group, within the community. Because if you're doing something that you don't feel passionate about, say like going out and protesting, there's something else that you could be finding much more use or creating much more um, product or output if you find that thing that you are good at and that thing that you can contribute. Um, because for me over the summer, I really, 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 really wanted to go to the protests. I really could not. There were a lot of reasons that I, you know, I could put them all out there, but there's a lot of people who had the same thing, you know, um, we all have roles. And I think for me and I think for everyone here, everyone listening, all the panelists speaking, um, really being self-aware, looking internally and thinking about what your role is can really help create leadership and create a community because you can't be a leader if you don't understand what your purpose is and um, what your passions are. So before we go out and try to rile up other people and get other people to find their passions the most important part is figuring out because I'm, I'm still in kind of this searching area of what is my passion um it seems like a lot of you have found it so I'm really happy about that um so yeah just being more um thinking about what I can do to help the greater community at large will then benefit everyone that's my, my next step. Doctor, thank you, Hannah. Doctor uh, Ishmael, do we have, a, do we have a, uh, a few more minutes to get your, your thoughts and Dr. Robinson's thoughts, Dr. Alcazar has made a point, his point. Do we have uh, moments to do that before I, I, I finalize this with a yeah, yeah, because we're, we're, we're going over time, so we, we do want to wrap this up. Um, I do want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon for this, um, you know, thought-provoking session. Um, one of the things I, I see here from Dr. Amity, it's great to hear the voices of our youth. However, we need the larger community to hear and engage in the same way. And uh, we're going to continue this discussion. Uh, we're going to have a summer institute um, early in the fall on Dill University's campus. Because obviously this conversation, 90 minutes is just not enough time. As we saw last night, the, these sessions need hours, uh, apparently, for, for conversation. So we're going to continue this discussion. It won't end today. So as we return early in the fall, we're going to have a summer institute. We're going to invite all of you to campus and obviously many more people. And, and those of you that are graduating, I'll just need to find some money to bring you all back to campus, um, et cetera, because we want you all to, to continue on um, with this dialogue. Uh, but certainly, you know, these are complicated issues. Um, that we're dealing with and you know and we can't just talk about them as Joe said we gotta gotta get involved in action and hopefully as we have this summer institute we'll have more time to dialogue but also outline action you know the purpose of this center is not just to talk 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 but to um, to engage in advocacy and so um, you know obviously in this type of format we won't have time to do that but as we reconvene in the summer early fall summer institute on campus we'll spend more time doing that as a group and I want, and hopefully all of you will be able to join the group um, you know, as we do this and outline some plans as we uh, move forward into the future, not only locally, um, uh, but nationally. And, uh, and as I kind of follow up on what Toya said, and I'm very proud of my students, Toya and Caitlin, you know, as they've come on, because I, I, you know, they, they came to build as young ladies and they're moving on as professional women. And I do, you know, plan to see them in media and in write-ups and all the great things they're going to be doing 
um, in the future in regard not only to race, but I mean, in all kind of various aspects of work moving forward. So I'm very proud of them. And, and as I've met other students from other universities today, I'm very proud of all of you in terms of the work that you all are doing and, and, and moving forward. So we look forward to, and you know, as some of us kind of transition out <laughs> to see the young people transition in, um, in terms of the kind of work that you all will do and share. And we look forward to, um, uh, to reading about. So I thank all of you for, for coming on today. Look forward to meeting you all in person, um, obviously sometime soon as we get our institute together, um, et cetera. Because I, I think it's important, and Joe mentioned this when we first started the center, the very first full conversation I had with them about this was getting the universities involved, not just being about Dillard, but working as a community between Loyola, Tulane, Suno, you know, et cetera. This, you, know, you know, we got to get out, et cetera, and we got to work together a lot of us have the same kind of mindset. We're all kind of working in isolation. And so this kind of platform you know, allows us to get in, uh, you know, your colleagues and show there's many students in your classes that are, have the same passion as you all. So we want to you know, bring them together in a very much larger community and hopefully invoke an action because action, you know, one person can make a difference, but a lot of people in a group can make a big difference, et cetera, in terms of voices. So, uh, so I look forward to that as, as we move forward. So uh, uh, Dr. Robinson, any last thought? Well, first, I'd like to acknowledge and congratulate all of the young people. Um, they did, uh, I think, a fine job in representing themselves and their positions. Uh, I'd like to reiterate something that one of the dynamic young ladies from Dillard uh, first suggested. Uh, no, it's the young lady from Lawyer. I think, I think Dr. Robinson is frozen on us. And um, when he comes back, but anyway, let me say this. I appreciate uh, what uh, Dr. Ashraf Ishmael said, hoping Dr. Robinson will, will, will join us back in a second. But let me, uh, look, Dr. Ashraf Ishmael has created this space in the Center for Racial Justice at Dillard University for us to have, for you to have that place where this new, new leadership emerges. And by, 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 by showing me your thumb, let me know if you guys want to be the core of that continued uh, discussion around that. Kaylin is saying yes. Sydney is saying yes. Ethan and Layla has got two thumbs up. Uh, Sydney is yes. Jamal is yes. We got unanimous, right? We're unanimous. You guys, look. We're going to be looking to your leadership to, to, to do that. I'm sorry we lost Dr. Robinson. Uh, but anyway, again, thank you. I mean, Ashraf, you said it all for us. So you're in control of this now. Thank you for everything. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for everything. Um, and thank you for the always attending. I see some, you know, a lot of comments uh, on the chat as I've been, as I've been reading and dialoguing and jotting down. Wait a second. Wait okay. a second. Um, Go ahead, Dr. Robinson, say, finish what you wanted to say. He Dr. called me. Go ahead. Oh, Dr. Robinson, go ahead. All I'm simply saying is that just like the Highlanders prepared Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and the other stalwarts of the last human and civil rights era for leadership, what we are talking about here is the establishment of an institute an ongoing training ground which will prepare young people for their rightful positions as leaders because what we need most in the last four years identified this what we need most are humanistic leaders who will move forward and move the human race forward and so i think this is uh, an outstanding platform and beginning of that initiative. So again, thank you all of the young people and my colleagues for endeavoring to establish just that kind of a movement. Thank you. And why not start it here in New Orleans? Why not? <laughs> well, the, the original Freedom Riders were destined for New Orleans, so now we're going to do the reverse role, right? <laughs> uh, right. Thank, thank you, Ashraf. Uh, and I guess everybody can press leave now. Yes, thank you guys. Right. Thank God you very you much. Guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank, Thank you. you.